what we're seeing in the world of college recruitment, I think, is very consistent with, with some of the headlines that, that you were sharing a few minutes ago. And that is a, a significant imbalance in, in the labor market, far more employers trying to hire, far more job openings than people who are applying to them. And some, I, I keep seeing people saying there are a lot more job openings than there are job seekers. And, and I call BS on that. The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Welcome back, everyone, to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy shift going on in the world of business, technology, and HR. Here's your host, Ira Wolf. Hello, Googleization Nation, and welcome back to another episode of Geek Skeezers and Googleization. Uh, we are right in the middle of June, almost officially in summer. I know for many, many of you across the country, especially on the West Coast, it is already in the heat of summer, record summer, 125 degrees in Arizona, I believe. But also the labor market is quite hot. Companies are struggling. We're going to be talking about that as we do every week. We got a great guest today, Stephen Rothberg from College Recruiter. And uh, he's been doing, he's been in the business for about 20 years, but we're going to be talking about how college recruiting has, has changed pre and ver- pre versus post pandemic, but just a few headlines. And it's, it sort of leads up to a conversation with Stephen. One is that just this morning, I'm going to, I have to read these because they, they were coming one after the other. Dorney, Dorney Park, I, I live in the Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania, Northeastern Pennsylvania. Dorney Park is big, a huge, Big, big amusement park. I uh, was family owned until a few years ago. Very, very popular. So you can imagine uh, last year they were shut down, anxious to get started. And they just announced this morning that they're going to be open only for five days. It's going to be Wednesday through Sunday due to staffing shortages. Uh, we keep hearing more and more about that. So it, it, this this going back to normal or, or waves to normal or return to normalcy, you know, or as we talk, it, you know, I, I use a term I picked up from someone else is never normal. And that's pretty much what it's going to be. Um, Many of us anticipated this 20 years ago. My book, Perfect Labor Storm, came out in 2004. I've been talking about the perfect labor storm since 1999. McKinsey talked about the war for talent. Nothing new here, but it it came, it arrived, and, and we reached the tipping point. And whether 2020 uh, was the year that that crossed or whether it was here before and we just wouldn't admit it. Many, many different things. But Amazon, just, I think two days ago, I think the New York Times ran a study and talked about three. They they had they hired three hundred and fifty thousand workers from July to October and or or only three. They hired three hundred and fifty thousand workers between July and October of last year. And they stayed only a few days or a few weeks which then fits into the next headline that came out that the quit rate of employees is the highest it's been in over 20 years. Price Waterhouse is going to spend $12 billion on their recruitment and hiring. They plan to hire 100,000 new people. That's not a a small chunk of change, $12 billion. And then the other things going on, fewer than three out of 10 white collar workers were actually working in the in their offices last month. So despite the the vaccinations and this return, there's still a lot of uncertainty. And there are people that are quitting work because they are asked to come back to the office. And there are people that are that are are stay that want to stay home. And there's people that their offices are closing and they want to go back to work. They don't want to continue to work out of their home. Uh, so it's, again, a, a very, very challenging environment. And then Indeed study said 27, 27% of unemployed job seekers are looking to switch. There are other studies that show that's as high as 40% of current workers. So unable to fill the open jobs that are now and then 
the churn is, is, is even accelerating. So a lot, a lot of work to be done. I'm just going to stop there. There's a couple other announcements, and then I want to be able to get to Stephen about that. Of course, we want to thank our sponsors, Ingomu. Ingomu new app launched for to how to be more. Nearly 100 coaches are available. And if you're using an Android, it's not available yet on the iPhone. But if you're using an Android app, a very, very easy way to get personalized coaching through Ingomo. And they are launching a new podcast as well. So go up and make sure you check that out. And of course, I want to thank Success Performance Solutions for being a sponsor of Geek Skeezers and Googleization too. A couple of webinars that are still running. They are free through the end of the month. One is on adaptability quotient. You can go to bit.live forward slash AQ520. And then there's also a second webinar, a one of my more popular ones talking about duct tape can't can't fix your broken candidate experience. And that's also available up there. There it is. No, that's actually the uh, the wrong uh, the wrong URL. So I left, forgot the, the name of the link. But we'll get that. We'll get that for you. Or, or you can just go up to my website or uh, reach out to me. Just comment and uh, we'll send you that link. And they are f- free through the end of the month. And then finally, the uh, CEO chat that I talked about last week went live on Friday. We had a great, great response to it. And you can get the uh, CEO chat also on the website. And there's a, should be a link right there. Roxy can put that up. There you go. You also go up to my website, successperformancesolutions.com and go to the blog. It should be one of the more recent posts that is up there too. So it's posted there. It's on, it's on YouTube and it's on RVN television, but uh, it's a half hour interview. We talk about jobs, millennials, Gen Z, some pre-employment testing. And then the second part of today's show after Stephen, I haven't, I keep getting uh, lots of questions. People are more and more interested in, in in pre-employment testing, pre-hire testing, and leadership testing. So I decided to take the second segment today. It was a real popular segment a few weeks ago. And just answer some of those questions, especially one of the more common ones. So stay tuned after our commercial, after the break, for the second part of the show. And we'll be talking about some of the differences in personality and pre-employment testing, uh, what you should look out for, and uh, some of the uniqueness, some of the new features that are coming out. But right now, I want to be able to, I want to be bring uh, Stephen uh, Rothberg on to Geek Skeezers Geek Googleization. There he is. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. So you you have a company. You have a you have college recruiter.com. It's about 20 years, I think. Is that in history? So pretty, pretty early on in this game, you had a vision that we'd be hiring people on the internet, right? <laughs> or recruiting people on the internet. <laughs> we we had an accident that we would. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we were publishing employment magazines in, in the mid 90s and a career service office director said that there's this thing called the Internet mm-hmm. and she didn't know what it was. She said, but you guys should be on it. And so we added a website and it was just the sizzle that would help sell the steak. We didn't initially think that employers would actually want to run ads online. Um, thankfully, we were wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right. About the same time, it was prior to 2011. I've had a website since 1997, and and you're right. It was it was the sizzle. It was a, it was an online brochure, and yeah. then 9 9/11 happened, and a lot of my colleagues who were speakers and consultants and and always traveling and booking, their business completely evaporated, and mm-hmm. I had a presence online and. You know, we didn't we didn't thrive during that period, but we 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 still had a steady income, and then it grew and grew and grew. And so we're often say, you know, an internet company, an internet marketing company that just happens to be in HR, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit about because you you have some tips on that. But let's talk about college recruitment. Obviously, you you heard about all the disruptions going on. When it was the first thing I heard of, the thought about was like, okay, Dorney Park, an amusement park, they're looking for college students, summer students part-time workers and yet they've got to shut down two days a week and they're they only have three or four months of a good season and they've got to shut down you know almost a third of their time for that so what what changes have you seen in college recruitment and i guess there's a couple parts of that but i'll, I'll throw it back to you sure yeah no sweat so 
you know, in terms of in college recruitment, I think it might be helpful to sort of di differentiate a little bit between sort of the, the different groups of that. So mm -hmm. you have you have in the U.S. you've got a lot of what we call one year schools, and they typically are trade schools. You get a certificate, you learn to become a truck driver, or you know, heating and air conditioning, or, or something along those lines. You've got um, two-year schools, com community colleges, some areas of the country call them junior colleges, and you're typically getting an associate's degree. And then you've got four-year colleges and universities where you get a bachelor's, master's, PhD. Most people think of college recruitment about the four-year schools, and they're thinking mostly about juniors who are going into their senior year, third year into fourth year, or graduating. So they're looking for internships. They're looking for mostly white collar jobs. The reality is, is that most post-secondary students, so one year, two year, four year schools, most of them, most of the time are looking for part-time and seasonal jobs. They're looking for the amusement park jobs, which, which are generally not career related. Nothing wrong with them at all. Right. Work experience, Good, honest day's work is, is great. What we're seeing in the world of college recruitment, I think, is very consistent with, with some of the headlines that, that you were sharing a few minutes ago. And that is a, a significant imbalance in, in the labor market. Far more employers trying to hire, far more job openings than people who are applying to them. And some, I, I keep seeing people saying there are a lot more job openings than there are job seekers. And, and I call BS on that. There are plenty of job seekers. There are plenty of people out there who are ready, willing, and able to do that job. But for about five decades, employers have gotten away with treating employees like crap and paying them like crap. And finally, finally, what we're experiencing right now is that employers are able to treat their employees like crap or pay them like crap, but not both. And when I see stories, I don't know that that amusement park, you know, specifically, but generally what I'm seeing from employers like that, that hire a lot of part-time, a lot of hourly, is that they're mistaken about what the prevailing wage is. The vast majority of employers truly want to pay a fair wage but also many of them, perhaps most of them, don't know what that fair wage is. So I suspect that if you went and looked at those employers, restaurants that can't open or that open 40 minutes late because the kitchen isn't staffed, amusement parks, retail shops, whatever, you're gonna see a whole lot of them paying $10.50, $12 an hour, maybe even $15 an hour. But the prevailing wage for that kind of talent in that geographic area might be $20 an hour. Mm -hmm. So why as a individual who's re-entering the labor force after being fired 14 months ago, why would you take a job paying $12 an hour or even 15 if you can do the same or similar work and make 20? It's, it's you know... We should be applauding people for making rational financial based decisions. We should be applauding them for looking at employers who who got rid of all of their staff 14, 15 months ago without a second thought about the impact on those employees and their families and now expect those employees to come crawling back to them and accept below market wages. It just it just doesn't make any sense. So there's a, there's a lot to unpack there, and, and obviously there's this has to do with region and geography, and, and you know versus urban versus rural. You know we're mm -hmm. sort of in the middle of Lehigh Valley, but we're we're booming. I mean Lehigh Valley's booming a lot of transportation mm -hmm. distribution. So going back, I, I'd like your opinion on this. I was actually asked this, and and I gave him my answer. We'll see if we align there. <laughs> Amazon, you know, I mean the Amazon story. You know, you know, huge. I mean, that's a huge rate of turnover. I mean, 350,000 people are hired in, in a three month period when there's not a lot of jobs out there and they turn them over in days. And the question is, and, and now they're talking about they're going to their expansion is, is happening so great. Obviously, Amazon's not going away anytime soon. You know, they even said the other day is they might run out of workers. I mean, you know, truly. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that may defy your there's not enough job seekers, except that. Why are they turning them over that quickly? I mean, and, yeah. and again, they are paying. 
I mean, so they are Amazon in, in most of, in most locations is setting a prevailing wage for hourly workers. Absolutely. Amazon, Amazon single handedly has created significant upward pressure on wages in just about every market that they've been in. They've also created significant upward pressure on the kinds of benefits employees, hourly employees should expect to receive and how quickly they get them. So if you go to work as, you know, moving packages in an Amazon warehouse, which is what the vast majority of their jobs are, then from day one, you get healthcare benefits. Um, And I don't recall whether it's single coverage or whether it's family or whether it's single and you can buy family. I, I don't recall. And it, it, it likely would have changed over time in, in any case. But there is no doubt that a lot of those Amazon warehouses where they employ, where they employ hundreds to sometimes thousands of people and, and they're hiring, like you said, the turnover is very often, you know, if they've got you know, 200 people working in, in a relatively small warehouse, they probably hire a couple hundred people every couple months and because there's significant turnover. I was reading recently that, that that's deliberate, that Amazon did set out, it was sort of Jeff Bezos' theory that the CEO, the founder of Amazon, that it would be bad for Amazon to have these package handlers work for Amazon for years and years and years. He wanted to have the turnover because if you have somebody who's with you for three years, they're almost always going to make more money than somebody who's been with you for three months. So by turning over their workforce frequently, that keeps a lid on the the, the compensation. I think, Ira, what's happening now, and I think you kind of alluded to it, is that they're running out of potential workers. And a lot of their warehouses are located in, in, in rural areas or what I would call an exurb, a suburb of a suburb. Yeah, that's where we're going to be. Yeah, public transportation tends to be minimal, often non-existent. And, but those were the best paying jobs with the best benefits for a long time. Now, as employers who had little turnover, are all of a sudden, you know, they go from hiring two people a year to 20 because their retail shop is now reopening. Though those people who would have gone to Amazon are now going to work in the restaurant. That's three blocks away. And so I think that Amazon, from what I've heard, and I don't know this firsthand from Amazon, but from what I've heard, Amazon now is going to be treating its employees more like a typical employer where longevity is valued. They want people to stay with them for a long time. That that improves retention and it reduces your need to to hire so many people. Right. And about 20 some years ago, one of my first big projects was working with a call center. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they had similar turnover. They they actually trained people for a week. And then the the following Monday when they were supposed to show up for work, they didn't show up and they got paid for the week. And, you know, they said, you know, how do we keep people for a long period of time? And one of the challenges that we had or one of the things that I told them, and if we can double the, you know, if, if we if we can have people stay for two weeks. We can have them show up for five days after the training. We, we basically cut their turnover in half. And, and I said, so why don't we set a reasonable goal of what can you do to keep people for, for 90 days yeah. or, or even 30 days and, yeah. and slow the, the, the cycle down? And, and that may be more in line with app, you know, a long term employment and Amazon may be considered a year you know, at that point. That may, that may be their goal. But that, that's good advice for any company. That, that's following that. So what are, you, what are you seeing with internships? Yeah. Internships this summer, summer of 2021, generally look very much like internships last summer, 2020, in the sense that the vast majority of internships this summer that in, in white collar areas, I'm not talking about an intern that's working in a factory where you literally physically have to be in a right. factory. But if you're working for, well, you mentioned PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, organizations like that with white collar, the vast majority of those interns are working from home, which you know typically means from parents' home, apartment, whatever. It's not that 
right now in mid June, it would be unsafe for those people to come back to the office because in most of the metro areas in the country, you now got vaccination rates of 60 to 70 percent. And people are kind of used to social distancing. We're better equipped to understand sort of what's a threat, what's not a threat right now. But the employers plan out their internship programs months in advance, sometimes 14, 15, 16 months in advance. So last summer, they were planning what they are going to do this summer with their interns. And last summer, nobody knew what the world was going to look like this year. But I'll tell you, I've been in many conversations about internships for the summer of 2022. And Almost every employer of any decent size wants those internships to look like two years ago and three years ago and four years ago. So students who are looking for internships, to, that, would, that would be a year from now, summer of 2022, they should expect that they're going to be back in the office in, in almost all cases. Are you seeing a shift toward paid versus unpaid? Because uh, yes. early in the past, most internships were unpaid. Yeah, um, you're, you're 100% right. And that also varies considerably industry by industry, right? So like the big four accounting firms have been paying their interns for a long time. But, you know, in entertainment, in public relations, it, it, it's almost viewed like as an evil by the employer to actually pay people for, for their contributions <laughs> to, to, to your profitability. And internships over the last, I would say five, six years, maybe seven years now, have been rapidly shifting from the default being unpaid to now the vast majority of them are paid. It's our belief at College Recruiter, and this is open for debate, that in almost all cases, an unpaid internship is a violation of the Fair Labor Standards Act, the FLSA. There are definitely exceptions to that. Nonprofit and government are specifically excluded. But the rule with the FLSA is that if you provide value to the employer, you have to be paid for that work. Mm -hmm. Well, I defy you to find an internship for a for-profit organization where the intern provides no value. I mean, they might, it's, it's not a balancing act. It's not like, well, we're being really good and we're training them and look at, look at what a great life they're going to have. The court's going to look at that and say, well, that and the price of bread are just about as irrelevant to this discuss, discussion. So let's talk about, are they providing value? They're providing value. Well, then you need to pay them and you need to pay them. Therefore, the, the prevailing minimum wage which in 2021, the minimum wage is not going to get you anywhere. You're not going to hire them. So the reality is those who are fortunate enough to find internships this summer generally are being paid way more than they would have been two, three, four years ago. Interesting. So let's talk as we're getting toward the end. I want to make sure we cover it. College recruiter. I mean, yeah. so if, if I'm a, you know, let's talk both sides. If I'm a student, I'm a college student, or if I'm the employer, how, how does that work? Yeah, so we have a typical job search or job board model where employers pay to advertise their jobs with us. And for us, that's, that's any job that requires zero to three years of experience, part-time, seasonal, internship, what we call entry-level jobs. The candidates, in our case, the students and recent grads, they use the site for free. And that's, again, that's the case with almost all job boards, indeed, LinkedIn, you know, a college recruiter, or whatever. The the kinds of jobs that they're going to find on our site generally are from larger organizations, but there are plenty of exceptions to that. And the reason for that is that the a large majority of students and recent grads are employed by large corporations. You know, there's this conventional wisdom that's wrong that most people work for small companies in the U.S. And it's actually not true. Most people are hired by small companies, but the people who are actually working mostly are working for big companies. Small companies turn people over faster and they tend to go out of business faster. And it's exactly the same in the world of college recruiting. Yeah. And I think, I mean, as a small business and I work with a lot of small and medium sized businesses, I think part of it is, is 90, is it 92 or 93% of all businesses are small businesses, but sure. they, they may only employ 
So people say most people work for small businesses because 90 some percent of businesses are small. But when you're looking at somebody, you know, how many companies, how many small companies do you need to put together to hire 50,000 people or 100,000 people? And here's Deloitte. They're going to hire 100,000 more people. You know, that's a lot of small businesses that would have to be struck right. together and, to be able to do and, that. And, you know, and, and although there are certainly college students who look like you and I do, <laughs> older, uh, the, the reality is the vast majority of the people that a Deloitte, a PwC, an EY, whatever, that, that they are generally 21, 22, 23 years of age. They are at the beginning, not not middle or end of their careers. Yeah. Do you see any trends on the types of jobs that are being posted for the colleges? Or is, has that shifted at all? Pre uh, yeah. What we're seeing at College Recruiter, and I suspect this is the case with, with other online sources, virtual career fairs, job boards, those sorts of sources, is a lot more of the uh, part-time seasonal hourly. Just like the amusement park you talked about, there are a lot of organizations out there that, that in years past would not have looked to colleges. They would have looked to workers on temporary work visas coming from Romania. And that's another issue that's impacting some of these hospitality is mostly hotels, theme parks, whatever, employed a lot of workers from overseas in large part because they were cheaper and they undercut American workers in terms of wages. And now, you know, if you're coming from Romania, it's going to be pretty darn hard for you to get a work permit in an era of COVID. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's smiling because, you know, we've heard for years that if we didn't have immigration, we wouldn't be able to fill the jobs and we're taking new jobs away. And here we are. For example, we have no immigration and companies can't find people because, you know, whether it's people don't want to work, whether it's competitive, whether they don't have the skills, we won't get into the whole list of reasons why, but it's, it's going to affect the economy if we don't have immigration. So I don't want to turn this into a political show, but uh, you know, it's a conversation worth having. So maybe the title turn again. Steve, we're, I, I can talk to you for a, a long time. We, we just got the we, first introduction and would love to have you back. I know we said we were going to talk about even marketing. I mean, some of the, what you've learned about that, you know, pay, for pay-per-click and, and so forth. And people think it's so expensive, but there's an art, it's really an art and a science pay-per-click and marketing and love to have you back and have a conversation about that. But how can people get a hold of you? What's the best way if they want to reach you, but also if they want to learn more about the college recruiter? Yeah, sure. So if, if they're you know looking for a job or just want information about college recruiter, there's the URL right there, collegerecruiter.com. Thank you. And certainly feel free to reach out to me. I'm not shy about sharing my email address, uh, Stephen, S-T-E-V-E-N, at collegerecruiter.com. And of course you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever, same, same, same thing. Treat them well, pay them well, and you won't have trouble hiring. As sage old, old sage advice or sage old advice. Um, companies still haven't figured that out yet. I have, I have one final question. I, I, mm -hmm. I like to close with have you back. Hopefully we'll have you back before the year, but if we're in June of 2022, what are we going to be talking about? June of 2022, we're going to be talking about a lot of businesses that have gone bankrupt over the last year. That that and it saddens me. A lot of business, small businesses, and even some large businesses that have struggled to stay alive are not going to make it because they're not they're not going to be able to get their employees to subsidize their business models. I'm seeing this with restaurants that have been operating on a razor edge mm -hmm. and they kind of felt like as soon as they could have customers coming back into their restaurants, they would start to be making money again. The owners could, you know, go buy that boat or, or whatever it is that, that, that they wanted to do. And by the time that those owners are ready to see the reality that they're going to have to pay those servers $18 an hour plus tips. So they're making 30 bucks an hour. Right. I think that they'll be out of business because customers that have terrible service or that the restaurants are closed or the theme parks are closed a third of the week, they're just going to move on. They're, they're going to say, I'm right. not going to that restaurant anymore. I'm not going to that theme park anymore. And I think it's going to be an insurmountable hurdle for some of these businesses. So 
not that I advocate panicking, but if I'm a business owner that's struggling to hire right now, some panic is probably a good thing to, to get you to boost your wages. Take yeah. less of a profit, take less of a salary yourself, pay your employees. I posted something on LinkedIn this morning, the old Jack Nicholson quote, you can't <laughs> handle the truth. <laughs> and uh, we've been saying that for 20 years and it's still that way, but I'm not, not sure if that's panic or, or being candid and truthful and, and honest with somebody. And it, one of my, he'll be a, a guest in the future, but David Hull, H-O-U-L-E, he, he published a new book on cognitive dissonance. And he had a great analogy and he talked about everybody wants the light at the end of the tunnel. Everybody thought as soon as we're vaccinated and we'll get back, all the all the, the restrictions are lifted and, and we're just going back to this normal. And, he's the, and, and, and I've talked about we're not going back to normal and what normal looks like will be different. But he had a great analogy. He said, we, we entered a tunnel last year and everybody expected we were going to come out and it was going to be the same weather, the same environment. It was going to, it was going to look the same. And we came out and it's, it looks very different. And, and I continue that analogy and that metaphor is that it's, it's like going through a series of mountains that you you mm -hmm. go in, it gets dark, you come out and it's slightly different, but then all of a sooner or later, you're back into another tunnel and then you go through that and the weather changes and the environment changes and and you get your your bearings and then you're in through another tunnel again. Yeah. And that's, that's sort of life. So that's really, really scary to other people. We talk about adaptability all the time and it can go on forever. We are at the end of our segment. Appreciate, thank you, Stephen. Appreciate it very much. We will be, I certainly going to be continuing to be promoting a college recruiter because a lot of, a lot of clients we work with, they're struggling with that and they hadn't heard of it so before. And uh, we'll take a look. And I, I encourage everybody else to please stay safe. Definitely want to be in touch again, have you back on and continue the conversation. Thanks. I'd be delighted. Thank you, Ira. Well, that was uh, it was fascinating. And again, I, I do encourage you to go up to collegerecruiter.com. Thank you, uh, Stephen Rothberg. Uh, we are going to take a short break. We're going to hear from our sponsors in Gomu and Success Performance Solutions. And we'll be right back on the Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show. Hiring top talent shouldn't be left up to the roll of the dice. And yet, that's exactly what many organizations do. They roll the dice, cross their fingers, and pray for a better outcome. Hiring the right employees the first time is much too important and way too costly to leave to a game of chance. Your employees and your customers deserve better. For 25 years, Success Performance Solution has been helping small and medium-sized businesses hire smarter. They offer pre-employment and leadership assessments from typing and data entry to C-suite competence. Whether it's production, sales, healthcare, call centers, or management, Success Performance Solutions can help. Visit their website at www.successperformancesolutions.com to schedule a free demo or call 800-803-4303. Imagine growing great employees and advancing emerging leaders for less than a dollar a day. The Ngomu app will support your employees in a myriad of ways, from career and personal development to health and wellness. No need to schedule and hold trainings. You just have them access over 90 coaches for live virtual group and one-on-one -on -one coaching for whatever topic they need or want to work on. Anytime, anywhere. Learn more at Ngomu.com today. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. If you're not a subscriber yet or a member of Googleization Nation yet, please go to googleizationnation.com. Uh, it's free. We just need a first name and an email. And then almost weekly, try to try to keep it weekly and 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 sometimes more frequently, but rarely, we'll send out updates about who the, who the next guest will be, some other significant events such as my interview with uh, on RVN TV last week with Alcini and Joe Asumendi, Asumendi, and uh, we were talking about jobs and hiring and recruitment and millennials and Gen Z and, and pre-employment testing and a, and a number of different things. So you can uh, catch the, the show up on the website. You can see it scrolling down below. Appreciate that. And you'll also get uh, updates about webinars and, and, and other events. But wanna, I want to I want to thank uh, Stephen Rothberg before we go too far again for being in our being our guest in the first segment. CollegeRecruiter.com. Definitely check it out for anybody who's looking to hire 
college students, students, young people, recent grads, or interns, or if you're looking for a position and you happen to be a college student or a recent grad, check out collegerecruiter.com. One of the uh, questions uh, that we get all the time, uh, success performance solutions, we often get questions about is the test, you know, is the test valid? Is it, it, is it reliable? And we get, do you have a test for sales? Do you have a test for customer service? Do you have a test for a mechanic? Do you have a test for healthcare? And, and I just wanted to talk not necessarily about one system that we we promote or we encourage people to use. We call it the elite assessment system. Um, but just some of the differences and, and some of the things that you might want to check. And and people overlook the third parameter when people are looking if, a, if a, an assessment is qualified. And again, validity, it's validity, reliability, and job relevance. Those are the EEO criteria. That's what the EEO guidelines, that's what the Department of Labor, that's what any any employment law attorney might might say to you if that if you're using a test here here's here's the criteria that we need and validity just means that what the assessment is constructed to test is is is, is accurate and so if it's supposed to test for extroversion it's actually testing for extroversion if it's, it's testing for detail orientation and it's testing for detail orientation, if it's testing for typing skills, it's testing for typing skills. And, and so there, there's got to be a, an alignment there. One of the, the examples I use is that if you went to the ER and you're having chest pain and the first thing that they do is they test your blood sugar and they say your, your, your blood glucose is good. It's normal. It's in within normal range. That may not help the diagnosis, but it was an accurate assessment. The diagnosis that you're looking for is: Are you using a test that's valid? Is it testing? Is it could be, it could be valid and accurate in testing what it's testing for, but it also has to be relevant to the job. For instance, there's a pretty famous case law out there in the employment law circles that for frontline workers, the company was was testing for leadership skills because they wanted people to come in that had the ability or the potential to move up into the ranks. The problem is that it discriminated against a lot of minorities, a lot of the protected class by using that leadership test. And But it wasn't relevant for the job that they were initially hired to do. So, so although the leadership assessment, the assessment they were using was legal, it was valid, it was reliable. And if it were used for leadership, it was job relevant. The problem is it was it was viewed as not being job relevant because you were testing for leadership skills on production frontline workers. If you brought them in, if you hired them and then tested them on the leadership, it would have been fine, but they were using that to screen out people. So validity is literally just is what you're testing for is accurate. Reliability means if we test today and test them tomorrow and test them next month and text next week, will you get a similar result? Does it have to be exactly the same? No, because we're human beings and we're going to change answers. But it, it has to be within a statistical significant range correlation that it's accurate. So we look at validity. Are you testing the right? Is the test testing the right things? And is it accurate? And then reliability is, can you repeat those results over time? But the third part is job relevance. And this is what I wanted to get into today. Most tests, most any personality tests that are used for hiring are based on what they call the big five model or ocean. Ocean represents openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and non-emotion. Or some people call it the N is neuroticism, which is not a clinical diagnosis. It just means people are more excitable and reactive than they are reserved and maybe complacent. So ocean, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and non-emotion. And those five scales in many, for, for tools like Caliper, Hogan, we recommend Outmatch, Preview, Big Five. In all those assessments, that's the core. And what the psychometricians and the test publishers have done, have taken each of those scales and subdivided them into other scales that may fit under that umbrella. So they've taken conscientiousness and they look at that as, are you organized? Are you structured? 
Are you process oriented? Do you tend to follow the rules? They look at extroversion and and talk about your group orientation and how outgoing you are. So I, again, but most of these studies are based on this big five. You might you can also go look at the 16PF uh, is an, is another model that it's that a lot of these are baselined against, and uh, Neo Five is still another one. And uh, again, so most assessments that are out there are based on this big five model. It has been demonstrated to have job relevance. The challenge in in our mind comes one does every if you're using the same five scales or the same baseline and you measure everybody in extroversion or group orientation or outgoingness, uh, so there's some jobs that that may not be relevant, that may not be important. So for a frontline job, for a line cook, for a truck driver, for a maintenance person, for a mechanic, for someone in the trades, for somebody working in a laboratory, do they need to have, does it really matter if they're introverted or extroverted? That may be a cultural issue. And, and I can assure you it is of, of having a, a very reserved introverted group. And then you bring in an extrovert who likes to chat with everybody. They, they like to think, they need to think out loud. They need to converse with other people. They sometimes think before they, they talk before they think. And, you know, versus thinking before they talk, those are, that becomes a cultural issue, not a good or a bad. It doesn't mean they're qualified or not qualified to do the job, but there are jobs that extroversion is not relevant uh, to that. So Roxy, if you can show that first slide that I have, that's the one. So there are all these different jobs. and, And in most cases, people, most test publishers use the same questionnaire for all those jobs. And then what happens is they will benchmark it. So they might take a hundred people in an organization or in their study and identify if everybody takes the same question, we found that the people who scored and that were more extroverted may have been more inclined to be successful in sales or customer service, uh, where the people who are introverted may be more inclined to to fit into an engineering group or to accountants or actuaries, or if they have to work independently at home, maybe they need to be introverted. The problem with that is, is that doesn't mean that they're good or bad. It just means that uh, if you've only hired extroverted salespeople and you benchmark them against extroverted salespeople, then you become the tallest person in the room. But you can, you, you know, I always joke that I'm 5'8", but if I hung around with people that are 5'4", which are a lot of my family members, I'm pretty tall. But if I hang around with some friends who are 6'2", then I'm short. So if you only hang around with short people, then you can be the tallest person in the room. And that's similar what happens with extroversion, introversion, conscientiousness, and so forth. When everybody gets measured on the same, using the same profile, sometimes those scales are not relevant. And the problem with a lot of testing is, is that if you remove, if you said, we don't want to measure extroversion, we like the other four categories. We like to, we want to know what their self-control and their stress management is. We want to know how competitive or how agreeable they are. We want to know how conscientious, but we really don't care if they're extroverted, you can't remove that scale. So we we have a platform that we recommend. It's called the Elite Assessment System. And if you can show that second slide real quickly, Roxy, there you go. Just want to give you an example. We have 170 individually validated scales. So you can combine those into the ones that are relevant. So I just pulled two examples here. This is our Sales Hunter profile, and these can be customized. We can add or remove any of these if you don't want them, which is an advantage. Again, most any other any other assessment tool I have, we cannot remove any scale. So if you said, we don't like the assertive scale, we, we don't want the extroversion scale, you would be stuck with it. Within the elite system, the one that we're using, we can actually remove it. So a sales hunter profile, you know, has things like, again, achievement drive, assertiveness, extroversion, where if we were looking for a hospitality worker, you don't see assertiveness on there. You don't see extroversion on there. Uh, talk more about attitudes. Are they flexible? Do they have a helping disposition? Are they reliable? Will they show up? Are they responsible? Will they follow the rules? So again, you can, there are different traits, abilities, cognitive skills, attitudes, motivations that are required for one job versus the other. That's the direction that assessments are going into. If you want to talk about job relevance, you want to talk about meeting the criteria of EEO, 
rely, validity, reliability, and job relevance, then each assessment should be job relevant. It should be designed to test for the most important traits attitudes and abilities that they are. If you'd like more information, you can see you go scrolling across the screen, just go up to uh, successperformancesolutions.com forward slash elite, or you can just type in, uh, look for pre-employment testing and it will be up there. Again, that's a lot of often dr- kind of thrown out information, drinking out of a fire hydrant. But I hope that that answers some questions or if it raised more questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. You can reach me on LinkedIn. You can go up to the website, again, Success Performance Solutions, and or you can email me at uh, success at super solutions, I'm sorry, super-solutions.com, success at super-solutions.com. Again, I want to thank everybody for listening to Geek Skeezers and Googleization, for being part of Googleization Nation. Thank you for being here every every Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, or if you're watching our replay or a podcast. It might be on iHeart, Spotify, Apple, Google, you name it. We are, Our audio is replayed there all the time, or you can watch it at any time. YouTube, Facebook, or Talk for TV. Thank you again, Ngomu and Success Performance Solutions for being the sponsors. Thank you, Stephen Rothberg from collegerecruiter.com for being our first guest today. Learned a lot about college recruitment and college internships. And until next week, don't let the shift hit your plans.